All right. Looks like we are live on YouTube, Facebook, Twitch, and Smoke Signal. Um, sorry, dad joke. Um, but thank you very much for, for joining us for historical filmmaking with um, Dr. Carrie Wynn and myself. I, we taught a class together last summer, and it was awesome. I, I enjoyed the experience, and I learned so much from her, so I know that you're going to as well. Um, but... Carrie, oh, I, I was going to introduce myself. I'm, I've done so many of these now. I'm Matthew Nyquist, assistant professor in the mass media department, um, specializing in film and video. Dr. Wynn, take it away. Hi, and I'm Carrie Wynn, and I teach in the history department at Washburn, and I teach um, U.S. history. So, uh, and my specialties are turn of the 20th century and American Indian history and women's and gender history as well. So a lot of my examples, a lot of my um, research kind of uh, databases that I can show you, things like that are pretty US centric. So if you have any questions about, you know, world history more generally, I'm going to impromptu volunteer Tom Prosh, who's already on the call, who will answer questions about specific databases. Um, but one of the pitches I'm going to make is that really, when thinking about doing historical documentaries, right, and thinking about historical work, um, it's really a great benefit often to work locally. Um, you don't have to think about covering something that you might consider to be a grand topic or a topic outside of your local community. Very often, some of the best historical documentaries take something from uh, your own community, something that you want to explain, right, or a story that you have heard and unpack that story to show much bigger currents, right? Um, so I'm going to share my screen for just a moment because I've got it is disabled. Um, oh, that's my that's my fault. I will enable. That's okay. That way we'll get all this technical stuff out of the way at the beginning as well. Uh, kind of get all good. of our foibles. Okay, good. Um, and so please, those of you who are on Zoom, interrupt me at any point if you have questions. Um, that's how I love to operate. And I think Matt's going to run kind of chat a little bit. And I would say I too, if this interests you as well, um, you know, please feel free to contact me anytime. Uh, my email, I'm sure, will be available in some way through Wi-Fi, and I'm happy to give it to you. Um, and also too, we offer classes in this. As Matt said, we taught a class together. But most history classes at Washburn or at your local university can tell you a lot more about historical research. This is really just the tip of the iceberg, right? So um, I'm going to cover some of the historical portion, how you look for sources, what are good sources, and how do you weave those into a historical narrative um, while well, uh, Matt tells you a lot more about how to make that communicate to people through the documentary form, right? So I wanted to talk a little bit about framing a topic and thinking about a topic before we begin. Um, and I want to make the pitch, I already said this at the beginning, that you want to think of an event or a person or a place that will allow you to explore questions that interest you, right? So your questions may be much larger, but you want to pick a topic that's actually pretty narrowed, pretty centralized. Um, I often think about the documentary that came out a few years ago. It was called Miss Navajo, and it was about gender and youth in uh, Diné uh, society and communities, but it was explored through the experience of one young woman as she went through the Miss Navajo pageant. So you can use a very concentrated kind of topic to explore really broad questions about whatever you want to study. Um, I've already made the pitch to work locally. Um, you should also, I think, consider the relevance to today. One of the reasons I think documentaries are so powerful, historical documentaries, is that you have to understand the past to understand many of the things we have in the present, many systems, many institutions, many of the ways we relate to each other. And so understanding the history really is a key point and visuals, audio, the explanations that interviewees give, these are all really powerful ways to explore that history. So consider the relevance to today, 
explain to people why they will think it's important or why they should think it's important. Why was this significant to them? But work on something that you're passionate about. What are you passionate about? What stories need to be told? What do we need to understand about the past to understand the present? Think about these as you're thinking about what topic you would like. So once you have a topic in mind, and actually even before you have a narrow topic in mind, you're going to want to do some research. I'll talk to you in a moment about where to go to do that research and how to contact people who might be helpful. I'll also talk a little bit about different types of sources that you want to use. But before we get into that, I just want to say about research that once you embark upon a historical documentary, it is your job as a historian, it is your responsibility as a historian to seek the broadest array of sources you can and as many perspectives as you can to tell that story, right? And sometimes you have to do the legwork. Um, if I'm going to make a documentary about, let's say the Homestead Act in Kansas, right? In 1862 um, and kind of questions about settlers who come to Kansas, I'm gonna find it really easy to go into an archive and find documents from those white settlers who came to Kansas looking to found farms. I'm gonna find it more difficult to find the stories of Osage men and women who fought against the encroachment of settlers on their own land. But it's my responsibility as a historian to seek out those stories and will give you some possibilities for your research to be able to do that, right? So think about the past from new perspectives and really cast your research broadly. Okay, Matt, that's my first pitch about research. Um, do you want to say a little bit about sure. the uh, tagline? Go ahead. Sounds good. All right. So I apologize for my voice. My allergies are bad, but I am absolutely just fine. Um, so let me share my screen now. Wonderful sharing screen dance that we do as Zoom professors here. <laughs> okay. Oh, um, yours so, are so pretty. Okay. Oh, the, yeah. Um, I have to actually give a shout out to Dr. Anglin. He, um, he gave a presentation in my class and it really made me want to up the game of mine because his looks so much better than mine. <laughs> so, um, but okay, so back to, to this. Um, so talked about the beginning of research here. Um, the first thing generally that you want to do um, in terms of making your documentary and film in general is to start thinking about a log line that you can then build out of. Um, log lines are basically a, um, it's, it's similar to a synopsis, but it's a little bit more of a sale because this is something that you would say to collaborators or investors to get them interested in your topic. Um, but by consolidating it so nicely and neatly into a log line, it really helps you also focus in your script. Um, and it gives you, kind of, or, or outline, um, and it gives you kind of a through line through which all the research um, and everything you're doing can be kind of funneled through because you don't want kind of random pieces of information. You want something that's going to fulfill your through line that's going through the entire movie. So um, the log line is um, really just your pitch, okay? Um, and this is basically one sentence. So I have some examples there at the bottom. So Blackfish. A documentary following the controversial captivity of killer whales and it's dangerous for both humans and whales. So it has what it's about, why you should care, okay? And um, a nice little um, kind of intensity there too. Controversial captivity of killer whales. You wanna have something that's gonna bring people in. Catfish, young filmmakers document their colleagues budding online friendship with a young woman and her family, which leads to an unexpected series of discoveries. There we have the twist there at the end. Um, and any kind of irony that you could put in your um, log line is really, really great. Um, so descriptive and um, grabbing and pitch like, but having an irony there, especially at the end is a really great way to bring the user in. Um, there's a book I recommend called Save the Cat. It has a really nice section on log lines and, um, and pitches, et cetera, um, if you want to know more about that. So Jack asked the movie, not one of the movies I've even seen, um, but I know that a lot of people have. So Johnny Knoxville and his band of um, maniacs perform a variety of stunts and gross out gags on the big screen for the first time. So again, 
um, the big thing here is, I guess it's it's moving from a movie theater, or excuse me, from the TV to the movie theater. So that's a bit of a twist there. Band of Maniacs, that's something that might interest um, their demographic and a variety of, of stunts there, which might be interesting. This film is not rated. Um, this was an interesting one about the American Movie Ratings Board. Um, so Kirby Dick's expose about the American Movie Ratings Board, that one's incredibly straightforward. But um, it tells you exactly what you need to know that it's an expose. It's going to be a investigative type situation. Um, the Internet's own boy, the story of Aaron Schwartz, the story of a programming prodigy and information activist Aaron Schwartz, who took his life at the age of 26. Now, that's, you know, a pretty big twist there at the end. And it's very, un very unfortunate because it's a, a real story. Um, but that's a very grabbing thing. People would want to know why someone with a bright future seemingly would want to um, do that. And it's, it, it brings you in. So this is your log line, the first part of your, your pitch. You also want to develop that out into something called an elevator pitch. So this is usually around two minutes. The idea is you could pitch it to someone in the amount of time that you'd ride an elevator with them. Um, so this could be a potential collaborator, a camera person you really like, a, a cinematographer, or um, you know even someone that you want to interview. Um, but this also could be a potential investor that's going to invest in your film. And then your longer pitch, the greatest thing you've ever heard happens. And they say that they're interested and they, they're potentially interested in working with you or, or um, funding your project. The tell me more is the best thing you'll ever hear as a filmmaker. Um, then you can flesh out the movie over about 10 minutes um, to really tell them everything that's, that's going on. Um, so treatments... Um, are kind of a, a, an, an ex expanding of, of your log line. Um, so in basic terms, it's a summary of your film. This is written in prose. So just, it doesn't have to be a script. It's just writing a summary. Um, it's the backbone of telling your story. There's no set um, format for treatments, um, but you, you know, there is, it, basically you just want it in kind of block writing as a normal anything else, single space. Um, now there is an app that's free called Highland two, and it will give you a treatment, um, template that works really well and allows you to not really have to think about that part of it. Um, so treatments are done usually towards the beginning of the writing process in both narrative and documentary. Um, you can also start on index cards to help you pace out your idea. And actually a lot of the screenwriting software has incorporated that kind of writing now into it. So you can also do that digitally. Um, but it allows you to just kind of get your ideas out onto the page. So you know of kind of where you're going. Now in a documentary, this could change based on the people you're talking to and that sort of thing. But you have an idea of what you want your through line to be. Um, there's a process called ideation, which I've only heard in film circles. I don't know if that's, it's, that's a word outside of that. Um, but it, it, it is the, the process of ideating or basically having ideas that go into to your process, creative ideas. Um, we'll talk about this at the end, but treatments can also help you protect your ideas, um, especially if you chronicle your changes throughout. And it's also a tangible document to give to prospective collaborators and investments. So one more slide and then I'll hand you back to Carrie. Um, so what should you include in a treatment? So this is, it, even though there's not a set format, um, there is information that people want to know. So title and date of the revision, and it's good to, to keep each revision. We'll talk about that later. Um, your full name, also address and phone number, not necessary for classes though. Um, I know some people don't like to do that, but if you're actually giving that to investors, you're giving that to folks, um, then you definitely wanna do that. Your log line, which we just talked about, your summary, um, and usually you want this on one page, um, unless it's a, a feature doc, then you can um, space that out a little bit. But if you're doing a short, you'd want it to fit on one page. And specific lines, context, or visuals of paramount importance to enhance your summary. So if you're doing a documentary on an old building or something, thinking about a way that you're going to shoot that in an interesting way might be a, um, a good idea. All right. So that's log line and treatment back to you. Excellent. This is fun. Flipping back and forth. Yes. Uh Oh, I lost my, there it is. 
It's the uh, Zoom dance. I know. I lost my place. Here we go. Um, okay. So uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the process of how you find the evidence upon which you base all of the things that Matt just talked about, right? So how before you ever get to a log line before you ever get to your elevator pitch, you need to do research to firmly establish yourself within the historical setting, right? To research the topic that you want to research. So um, that will begin for us with a couple of definitions, right? Because you want your evidence to be broadly based. And historians work with two general types of evidence, two types of sources. And these are really kind of broad categories and broad buckets. And within them, there's a lot of diversity in the types of sources. So um, historians talk about primary and secondary sources. This is really key to historical work because you need to understand the nature of the sources, the nature of the evidence you're going to deal with. So when I talk about primary sources, I talk about sources that are produced at the time of the event that I'm studying. So, and those can be just about anything. Um, they can be photos, newspapers, speeches, diaries, novels, art, advertisements, um, gosh, films, um, podcasts are getting to be documentary primary source evidence for what's going on today, right? So um, you're really looking for, when you're looking for primary sources, accounts of people who have a first person or at the moment perspective of the event that you're talking about. Now, primary sources, though, can also include um, oral tradition, right? So um, those may not be given to you by someone who was there at the event, um, but for people who maintain their history through oral tradition, the accounts of stories can remain pretty stable and can also be considered primary sources. Um, for secondary sources, these are accounts written by historians about the past. So if you've read um, any kind of uh, book written by a historian, that's secondary, right? Um, journal articles, um, sometimes newspaper articles if they deal with the past, lectures, documentaries. Um, but what you're really looking for when you're doing historical work, the kind of gold standard of the secondary work is a peer reviewed source, right? So what do we mean by peer review? So peer review is a process. It's exactly what it sounds like. But if you don't write historical work or academic work, you might not know what it entails. So if I, as a historian, write an article, um, let's say I'm writing about land grants, the topic that I brought up before, I select a journal and I want to publish it. I've written an article and I want to publish it. I would submit that article to a journal that has an editorial board to review my work because it's academic work. So Kansas history or the Journal of American history or some sort of academic press, if it's a journal. Um, if it's a book, I might send it to a university press, right? Um, Rutgers University Press or Harvard University Press. Um, these are presses that publish academic work. So what does peer review mean? It means when I send that article or that book to the press or to the journal, they send it out to other experts who do research in my field so that my article is essentially checked, right? Um, are, it, are the specifics of the article correct? Is the larger context correct? Have I taken into account the other ideas that other historians have brought up recently? Have I looked at the relevant primary sources? It's basically a kind of quality control mechanism. It doesn't determine the argument that I'm making, right? That is my own, but it does give an indication of the quality of that article as viewed by my peers who are experts in the field. So if you're looking for secondary research, if you're looking for the work of historians that's really going to fuel your study and fuel your research, you want to look for peer reviewed sources. Um, you want you don't want to go to Wikipedia, right? Uh, maybe you want to go to Wikipedia and check when someone was born. That might be a possibility, right? Uh, simple dates, sometimes they get okay. Sometimes the reference to other sources are pretty good there. But really for historical context, you don't want to use something like that. You want to use something that's been peer reviewed and vetted. And that's really important, right? 
Um, so you want your evidence to come from a broad array of both of these sources, right? Um, you want to draw from multiple types of sources. You want to draw from um, both primary and secondary sources, but you also want to look at written documents, photographic evidence, newspaper articles, court cases, right? Um, court cases are actually really interesting historically. And a lot of working class people often show up in court cases, defending their property, defending their rights, um, rather than necessarily producing a speech that they're giving at a Founders Day celebration, say, or something like that. Sorry, I just watched a sitcom last night that had that in it, so it's in my mind. So draw from multiple types of sources, um, use both primary and secondary sources, both published and unpublished sources. And I'll talk about how to get to those types of sources to do your historical research as well. Um, sometimes you'll find that the official story or the published story that has come down through history does not match the unpublished sources, right? My class just worked with a book this semester which investigated what is called King's, King Philip's War, pardon me, um, in the 1600s. And the author, uh, Lisa Brooks, found that um, she, when you read the official accounts of the war, they don't include any women at all whatsoever. Um, but she found that many women in Wampanoag and Wabanaki uh, villages were key to the relations surrounding the conflict, right? So the primary sources were telling her things that the published sources had not revealed. So you wanna make sure to look at both of those two, primary and secondary, published and unpublished. You also, of course, this is very important to historians, uh, wanna provide appropriate credit. And Matt will talk a little bit later about copyright and we'll weave that in there. But I just wanna note here that there are many ways to give credit to your historical sources through using interviewees, titles, uh, maybe a website to accompany your historical documentary, which I would really encourage. It allows people to engage with the history content of that historical documentary. Um, and I just want to give kind of like a shout out here or a mention to a documentary I was recently watching um, called Ohiesa, The Soul of an Indian, which is about Charles Eastman Ohiesa, who um, was an activist at the turn of the 20th century. And um, the narrator of this documentary, right, it's a film that was produced by Sid Bean, um, but Kate Bean is the narrator. And she mentioned specifically that if you're gonna do Dakota history, you have to do oral history. And the um, documentary follows her through finding the story of her grandfather. So she encounters secondary sources, primary sources, oral histories. So the telling the story of the research is key to that documentary. So I think it's a great watch for both of those reasons. Um, okay, where do you start, right? Um, you know, if you've taken history classes before, you may have a leg up on this and know where to start. But if you're just starting and this is your first historical documentary, um, there are a couple of places you wanna go, right? And I would say you wanna start at the library both online and in person, right? Um, you want to talk to a librarian, right? Uh, as a historian, I'm gonna always encourage you to talk to people. There might be this kind of stereotype as history is a very solitary profession where we sit and we read our books, but really we're talking to people all of the time. And librarians and archivists are some of your best resources for finding these sources. So um, if you wanna read widely in peer reviewed secondary sources about your topic, that's where I would suggest that you begin. It's easier to access your topic by looking at the work of historians when you first begin, rather than going directly to the primary sources. It can be harder to interpret them if you don't know what other historians have already argued. And as a matter of fact, other his, like the footnotes of some of these peer reviewed sources will point you towards more sources, which will be helpful in your project. So start with the work written by historians. Start with the peer reviewed sources. There are several free databases including Google Scholar. This is not regular Google, right? That's another thing. Don't use regular Google. Uh, at least I would caution against it. The first hits that will come up are the most popular ones, not necessarily the best ones. So um, Google Scholar is often very helpful and will link you to those peer reviewed items. WorldCat sends you to books across the world. 
um, where you can also use interlibrary loan to bring them to your local library, right? So really you have the resources of the world, but it all comes through either your internet connection or your local library. At the library, you can go and access additional databases to which you need a uh, membership, right? So if you're a student at Washburn, here at Washburn, you can use the resources of the library. Um, if you are a resident of Shawnee County, you can use the Topeka Shawnee County Public Library. There they have Academic Search Premier, EBSCO, that's a great database. Local libraries will have different databases, but you can make sure that you can find those articles and those books by going to the local library and asking a librarian, right? Um, where do I find um, additional sources for my topic? Where do I find local experts? Um, so Matt, well, no, hold on. I was thinking about, do I wanna do this here? Or do we want another break? But let me do the archival portion first and then we can That's come great. back if there are other relevant things. Um, so go to the library, go to the archives, right? So archives are places where they have collected relevant materials that are historical, right? So here um, you can consider city, county, state, national, institutional archives, right? Some companies have archives that you can go in and you can go take a look. So I've got here an example. If I had a student who wanted to do research on Washburn history, here are the places I would tell them to go. I would say, go to the Washburn University Archives and Special Collections. We have one of those, right? Talk to the archivist. Go to the Topeka Room at the Topeka and Shawnee County Public Library. Go to the Kansas State Historical Society, which is also here in Topeka. Go to the National Archives in Kansas City. All of these are physical locations where there's an archivist who is ready to help you to find the resources you need. All of these archives will have online catalogs and they also have email addresses and phone numbers for archivists. So this is my biggest pitch. Before you go, take a look at what kind of resources they have and contact an archivist. Let people help you find the sources that you need um, or the sources that you want. Um, archives are good not only as primary sources, they're good not only for archiving the words and the documents and the images of people who came before us, but they're good as well for visuals. There are some really interesting um, kind of visual maps and other materials that you can use to give your documentary some interest and to explain different historical topics. And I'll come back to the visuals later. Um, Mm, I had an online one, I thought. There are other also online archives as well that you can look at. Ah, here, go online. Okay, you can also go online to find sources, right? Um, to find additional resources for primary sources. We're working more and more in a digital world. And um, the places that you can go include all of those that I've got listed here. Um, I'll put these actually in the chat, or can we make the slides available, Matt? Sure. Um, I plan to put all the, the panels on the, the Wi-Fi website, and we can put a link to the um, slides right underneath that. Excellent. I'll come back and show and tell some of these later if we have time. Um, but for now, I will say there are additional resources for primary sources at all of these different places, both published and unpublished, relating to Kansas, relating to the United States, relating to the world. And you can find in these places an increasing number of primary sources. As I said, I can show and tell and show you some later, but for now, I'll turn it back over to Matt. All right. Um, so I wanna emphasize something here. Um, as a filmmaker, you want to collaborate. And it's something I talk about a lot in my classes, that no one person has all the answers. Um, so as a filmmaker, and especially if you're doing a documentary, you want to have someone like Dr. Wynn or, um, you know, an expert in history or an expert in the topic that you're doing, because you can 
avoid a lot of the foibles that that might come with researching that topic. You know, they can say, oh, that is, you know, that that may look like a good source, but, you know, in actuality, it's this and that. Um, and the what she was just talking about, about the validity of your sources is so important because even one bad source, you know, in your movie, when you get your review, it's going to, it's going to just use that one bad source you used as a way to tear down your entire movie. So you want to make sure that all of your sources are vetted and you're using the sources that Dr. Wynn has talked about, because um, it's a, it's a house of cards and one and your, your toast. Um, so in regards to that, um, going to interview folks, which Dr. Wynn's going to talk about how to find people to interview, but when you're actually um, interviewing people, um, this is, can be one of the things that people are really anxious about, um, to talk to experts about various things. And there's all sorts of things that, that go into it. Um, but one of the easiest things that you can do to just um, make yourself a little bit less anxious is to bring questions. You know, it's surprising, but some people won't bring questions to interviews. You want to have a list of questions. So that way, if the discussion stops, you can go ahead and move on to one of your specific questions. And these questions are important um, in terms of how you formulate them too. You don't want questions that can be answered with one or two words. You know, is it this or this? It's that. I mean, unless you're trying to make a very specific point um, in the in a documentary where you're you know you just want it cut and dried, but normally you want them to explain and you want them to expound and you want them to give you that expert knowledge, right? Um, you want the subject to tell their stories. You want them to offer reflections and explore their feelings because that's the stuff that people are going to be interested in. Um, I worked on this documentary called Dare to Be Different um, about '80s music. And I say it's about 80s music, but that's not what it was about initially. Initially, the director was really interested in making about the lawsuit that took down this radio station that broke all this great 80s music. Um, but when we consulted with her and we were going through the edit because they'd been trying to sell it for several years, you know, the interesting thing, the thing that, uh, that connected with people and their feelings and their emotions um, were the artists. And... Um, the artists had a lot of history to them. So, you know, you, you want, you want to connect with that. Um, you want to provide the accurate information, but you, you want to make sure that you're letting your experts expound on, on them and not pigeonholing them to something very specific that you're chasing because initially, yes, lawsuit, but what ended up happening was all this great backstory and information about all these um, great musicians that, that people really love. Um, and also don't write leading questions. <laughs> you know, you must have hated the prosecutor that limited your freedom. Okay, that's a leading question. Don't ask questions like that. Um, what was it when the prosecutor made the argument that limited your freedom is, or what was it like when the prosecutor made the argument that limited your freedom is a little bit better, um, but you want to leave it open. You, you don't want to try to lead them down the path, you know, where you go. Um, the other thing I wanted to talk about with interviews is if you notice, there's this photo right here of some pretty typical interview lighting. And I just want to point out a couple things. Notice that the windows are drawn. Okay. Notice where her face is in the frame. Whoops. Notice how I click accidentally. <laughs> um, notice that she has some nice light in her eyes. Okay, and notice how her face is nice and softly lit. Now, this can be done with lights. It can also be done with what's called a bounce board. And you don't even need a specific bounce board. Okay, you could go to Michael's or wherever and get a big, you know, thick white um, poster board or whatever and use that to reflect the outside light on her face. That would, that would go a long way. Um, but you notice that she's cut out from the background. The background is dark, the dr things are drawn, but she is lit. You want to make sure that your interviewee is the focus of your interview, okay? Um, now, when you're actually there, you've done your prep. You want to have a conversation with your subject, okay? Discuss with them what interests you relative to the project, okay? So, and you can even start this ahead of time. Sometimes it's good to just sit down and talk to them for a little bit. Um, so they feel comfortable with you because you may be nervous, but they also might be nervous too. 
And that nervous energy can really come through on the interview. So that can help you have a connection. Um, discuss what are called overlaps. So overlaps are basically, if I'm asking you a question and you start talking while I'm still asking the question, it makes that audio very difficult to use um, when you're cutting things together. So you want to make it so when, when you're doing the back and forth, even if, you know, even if you actually wanted an interruption, you'd still want people to talk about it separately. Um, so that way you could edit it exactly how you want it later. Okay. So each question and answer should have a clean start and a clean end with never, uh, neither voice ever trampling on the other. Um, if you should happen to get an overlight, uh, an overlap, politely cut um, and explain to the subject nicely if there was an overlap and ask them to repeat. What you don't want to do is go, okay, cut. We got an overlap. Got to do it again. No, <laughs> you want to be kind to your subject. They are giving you time. Um, they are giving you their expertise and you want to treat them with respect always, even if you're frustrated with what's going on around you on set. Um, ask the subject if you can redirect a conversation if it deviates too far from the intended purpose. You know, if you're talking about something and they end up talking about something like their favorite hot dog and that's just completely irrelevant, um, you can redirect them to what the topic is at hand. And um, the interviewee actually ends up um, appreciating this because sometimes they're anxious that they're not going to have the right things to talk about. Um, do your best to know your questions ahead of time, not look at your index cards. Um, but if your mind does go blank, it's okay to, to look at them. Um, got one more slide and then I'll send you back to Dr. Wynn. Um, so starting the interview, you want to act relaxed and natural. Um, and this can be difficult. So if you're in any of the mass media classes, you've heard this from anyone that teaches 199 or any of the earlier classes, but you got to fake it till you, till you make it. You got to act confident and eventually, hopefully, you will be confident, um, but it's it's part of creating the right environment to interview another person. Okay, um, remain maintain supportive eye contact throughout. Nothing worse being interviewing and your interviewers kind of looking around or looking at the floor. It it creates a disconnect. Um, react and interact facially, but not vocally to avoid overlap. So nod. You know, make them know that you're listening. And them knowing that you're listening and listening actively will actually help them give better answers too. Um, listen intently for opportunities to follow up, okay? So um, if something happens, you can ask them questions. But one thing that we have may have difficulty with is um, you wanna make sure the interview is about your subject and not yourself. So, um, and a lot of times when you're starting out, you're worried that you're not asking enough questions, you're not being active enough, but remember that the interview is about them and not you. So that's okay, as long as the, the discussion is going well. Um, we talked about the questions, but make sure they're thought out and will stimulate answers. Avoid those leading questions again, and don't apply pressure on your subject, okay? So um, now under extraordinary circumstances, if you're doing it, you know, you, you really just need it, an answer to a controversial thing. Okay, maybe then. Um, but know that you're probably going to burn some bridges and you might not ever be able to interview that person again. They might speak out against your documentary, you know. So um, be prepared for the consequences of that. And definitely in class, you wouldn't want to do that. All right. Back to Dr. Wynn. Oh, I think you're muted. I did that yesterday. As I told my class yesterday, I said some really profound things while I was muted. So <laughs> I'm very sorry that you missed them. Um, <laughs> but uh, so let me, uh, I just, I think have one slide to show um, for this uh, at first, because um, so in first thinking about interviews, there are a couple of different types of interviews that you see appear in document documentaries, right? So some are the experts, right? The historical experts. They don't necessarily have to be historians, but they're kind of the equivalent of the secondary sources. They're talking from their research about the subject um, that they are not directly involved in. Right. Um, but then there are also interviews with people who are directly involved in the topic or the subject. And those are much more like oral histories where you want the person to talk to you about their experience. Right. There can be some blend between the two. But the first thing I want to talk about is the kind of historical expert part of that conversation. 
because often documentaries use instead of narration the words of historical experts to tell the story right so before you go in to talk to those historical experts you want to have done your reading you want to have done your own research but i think you also want to contact historical experts as matt was saying early and often right and there's a lot of places where you can find these people and for some of our students in class this summer um, a pivotal moment for them was when they talked to a faculty member or an archivist and they were able to hear that person's perspective on what had been written, it really advanced their research a lot more than some of their reading had done even and sent them back to the archives with new questions. So you don't have to wait until you're ready to film the documentary to contact the historical experts. I would say find them as soon as you can if you want them to speak to you a little bit more about the topic and then speak again on camera. I would say that for some of us, that would be something we'd be absolutely happy to do. So um, we're now working in an age where it's really easy to contact the historians who wrote the books and the articles that you read, right? Some of them will respond. Some of them will not, but that's fine. So the email information or the phone information is available for many of the authors who wrote those books and articles that have inspired your research to move forward, that helped you narrow the question. A lot of those art authors will be located in academic institutions. And for some of them, part of their mission is to talk to people who are doing historical documentaries and serve as an outside expert. So university faculty are great people to contact. Contact. Um, if you're around Washburn or willing to call us, many of us at Washburn have served as historical experts for documentaries for History Day, uh, for local documentaries, for things like that. If, if you find a university faculty member on your topic, you might have a couple of benefits that come from this. They might not only know the information, but they also are used to teaching people. They have taught their students about these topics over time. So they know often how to convey the information in a way that makes sense and in a way that really drives the point home that they're looking to make or that they're looking to explain. So university faculty, university historians can be some of your best assets for historical experts. Look at your local history department. Look at Washburn's history department as an example. If you look at our web page, it lists the faculty and it lists our areas of historical expertise. So you can go to the website for the history department, sociology department, anthropology department, and you can see the faculty expertise and contact that faculty member who is most directly related to your topic. And they often will refer you if they do not know uh, very much about what you're doing your documentary about, they can refer you to someone else. Um, we love to talk to people about our research. So if you find somebody whose research it is, I don't think you'll have difficulty getting them to talk to you a little bit more about it and pointing you towards more sources. Archivists and librarians are also some of your best assets in looking for explanations of primary sources, for example, that are in their collections. They can tell you more about what types of sources are available to you immediately, who else you can contact to get to more of those sources, and they can also tell you a lot very often about local history as can historical society or site staff, right? So um, if you are in a place here, we have uh, Brown versus Board of Education. Here we have the Ritchie House. Here we have the Kansas Historical Society. Um, docents and interpreters at all of those sites are able to tell you a lot about the history that they interpret on a daily basis. And again, much like uh, faculty, their job is to explain that history to people. So they'll also be great at explaining when you get them on the documentary. Um, again, look at the website. Contact the uh, person who is the outreach person, right? The public education person at the historical site or the society. Contact the archivist or the public services or history librarian. 
Um, you can also contact tribal historians and cultural officers. You can contact government officials who, re who work for particular institutions. You can contact all sorts of people who are located within various institutions whose job it is to interpret the history of those institutions or those places. Um, and again, if you contact them while you're doing the research, that can help shape your research, and then contact them again, they'll know you. And some of these conversations become much easier and they're more at ease when they're on camera. So I can say something too about the um, contacting, I don't have a slide for this, but about contacting people who are not necessarily historical experts, but who are key to understanding a subject that you're studying, right? Um, historians very often conduct what they call oral histories with people who are involved in a topic. So um, for example, when I was in graduate school, I did an oral history of um, the Dixon Mounds historic site. And one of the um, interviews I conducted was with the person who was the director at the time, whom I found because I knew that I was studying the institution. And then I wanted to contact her and do an oral history about her experiences as the director. It was also an institution that had been in the news, so I wanted to contact the people who had protested at the institution over the years. So newspaper articles led me to names. Friends of friends knew people who had been involved. Once I got in contact with one person, there were other people whose names came up. You're looking for names, um, and you're also looking for networks of people who might connect you to each other. Um, and then, of course, it's always the person's prerogative as to whether they want to be in your documentary or talk to you about their history or not. There's no requirement that they share their history with you, right, um, that they share their stories with you. But there may be many people who are willing to share those stories, particularly if you've also done um, some research into the topic and are not expecting them to recount the entire history of the moment, but their perspective on the experience. And so you want to assure them, um, you wanna be able to tell them how their stories will be used. You wanna be able to tell them that they have the right to their stories um, and also to um, um, give them the ability to decide at any moment that they don't want their story to be part of your documentary, but that you'd be grateful if you could use it. Um, okay, Matt, back to you. I think that's my sharing for the moment. Oh, you're muted. It was my turn to do that. <laughs> um, I feel like we're on like a, a on like a TV broadcast, like and back to the station. <laughs> um, all right. So, um, lots of great information. The respective subject um, that she ended with is incredibly important. Um, when you're when you're doing a documentary, I always feel, and there's different viewpoints out there, but I completely agree that you want to completely respect the subject you're interviewing because if you're not inter respecting the person you're interviewing, then are you really respecting the topic? In my opinion, um, so in terms of actually shooting the interview, um, so now. Um, documentaries especially can lend themselves to more guerrilla style filmmaking, and that's great. Um, as technology has continued to progress, it's democratized so much of this, you know, as to where you used to have to have all this expensive equipment to make a documentary. But really now you can do that without having huge expense, and that allows so many more people to tell their stories. I think that's wonderful. Um, so I, I'm kind of focusing here on phone um, because the, the camera that's on your phone is probably better. I mean, it is, I'm sure it's better than the camera I used in grad school. I mean, the technology has just really progressed. Um, so if you do have a better camera, that's great. But um, phones work really well for this type of situation if you can get some better audio recorded. Um, so, Ensure that the phone, when you're doing it, is completely secured and small bumps won't topple it. There's some really great tripods you can get for phones that aren't incredibly expensive that will attach them very securely to things. I've even attached my phone to like railings to shoot down over high distances and the thing didn't budge at all. Um, but make sure you're, you know, really have it locked down and do some safe tests before you actually do that sort of thing. 
but there's some really good things out there. Um, you can also hold the camera. Okay. And this will happen a lot, especially if you're doing more guerrilla style, you know, low budget filmmaking. Um, so one of the most important things I can tell you about this is the more tension that you have in your hands, the shakier and the more wobbly and unusable your footage will be. So the way to do that is to take your tension out of your hands. So as much as possible, you kind of cradle and just hold the phone. All movement and everything else should come from your lower body. If you can see what I'm doing here. Um, you want it to all come from your lower body when you move kind of like, you know, if you're doing a sport, I'm not the most athletic, but let's pretend here. If you're doing a sport, you kind of want to move again from that, that lower body, bend your knees. Um, but you want to take all that tension out of your hands and all out of your arms, because again, the more that's in there, the more that you're going to have this kind of shaky hand effect, just because you're trying to hold so perfectly still. So if you just kind of cradle it and allow the rest of your body to do the movement, even with your phone, it will elicit much better um, stuff. There's also an app called Filmic Pro. It's not free, but it does have a stabilization on it that works really, really well if you just for some reason can't get that wobbliness out of your hands. Um, but um, yeah, and you can also rest the, the, the phone on different things as long as it's secure. Books can work really well to secure different kinds of things. Um, but again, you want to make sure it's not going to fall over and your, your equipment doesn't get damaged. Um, keep in mind that your subject may move around, kind of like I'm doing as I talk. I can't sit still when I talk. Um, so you have, might have a subject that's going to move in and out of the optimum framing that you've set up. And that's okay. Um, you know, you might have to adjust your composition. You can also give them an area in which to stay, um, but it depends on your subject because sometimes if you give someone an area in which to stay, they're going to get really rigid and they're going to be thinking more about staying in that area than talking to you. Um, and it's the most important thing is to get that information out of you. So if I, I would say if you have to pick one or the other, the information is more important than your, than your perfect composition. Um, be careful with doing zooms. Okay, zooms um, can affect the audience in, in various ways um, that may be unintended. Um, and you might be trying to reframe the subject, but zooms compress the background and they do some things that might make someone seem different than they're trying to come out of um, emotionally. Um, and <laughs> it also makes it difficult to edit. Um, because if you're zooming in on various parts, depending on if you had two cameras, which not necessarily part of low budget filmmaking, but if you can get your partner's phone and be shooting from two angles, then you can shoot back and forth if there's a mistake or something in one, and it just adds um, flavor to the process. And you can also add small zooms in the editing process. Um, you know, any any editing software, even the, the 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 free and cheap ones, offer usually some kind of um, zoom or scaling where you can slowly move in on something. And as long as you don't do it too much, you don't overdo it, um, it won't decrease the quality enough that would um, make a difference. Um, so where to sit and where to look? This is a pretty common question too. Um, if you sit off the side of the camera, um, the subject will seem to answer to an unseen third party. Like if I'm looking at the camera and I'm talking like this, it looks like I'm talking to someone that's off camera, right? It's the same thing. Um, when you're shooting. If the interviewer sits under the lens, the subject will seem to be talking directly to the audience. Um, this is usually what interviewers do, but it doesn't have to work 100% of the time. Um, if you're only using one camera, make sure that subject is always seen. If you're using two cameras, you could potentially do a close-up shot and a wider shot, and that close-up close shot might not always have their head in it as they move, move around. Um, the other thing is, and I was going to show a clip, but um, I don't I'm not going to show clips because I don't want to get copyright claimed, but um, 13th does a really great job at, um, at, at using um, less traditional angles and things to shoot the interviewing subject, but it's always related to story. You know, when they're talking about the world shifting in a negative way around um, African-Americans, um, they do a, a, like dolly shots where they're moving the camera around like this. And when you do that, it makes the world seem like, like literally the background is moving around the subject and it adds to what they're saying. 
So you don't necessarily need to just do the standard, um, you know, look under the lens thing, but it is an old standby if you just don't know which way to go. Um, if you're shooting multiple people, you need to either be able to pan between them, meaning tilt or uh, tilt is up and down, pan is left and right. So pivot the camera left and right to be able to get them in um, or shoot them both in the same frame. And you also need to make sure that they're both um, they're both audible. Um, did you want me to continue through, Carrie, or did you want to jump in here? No, I think you're good. Continue on, and then I'll just come in later. OK, sounds good. Um, so I went over this a little bit in my directing one, but it's also important for documentaries just to understand that you can manipulate deep space and flat space. And the key here is diagonal lines. Okay. If you have horizontal and vertical lines, um, like in the bottom picture, you're going to have a flat image. If you have diagonal images by moving the camera up, down to the side, you're going to create a deeper image. And um, it tends to be a little bit more pleasing to the eye uh, on a documentary type footage than shooting really flat. Um, you can also do this effect over here, the portrait mode effect. Um, you can, you know, there's ways to cheat doing it, but um, what you're actually, if you're using Filmic Pro or using a real camera, the way to do it is to manipulate your um, aperture. This is a little bit advanced, but you can manipulate the aperture. And as you manipulate it, you'll notice that less and less is in focus besides what you're really just really focused on. Um, and also moving the camera away and using a, 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 a bigger zoom, um, longer zoom will also help enhance that effect. This shot here shows how having two people can interact with each other um, and how a deeper focus, you know, maybe if you have two people that you want to get both of their reactions or something like that. Um, so with sound, um, this is also incredibly important, and this is another place that um, technology has really democratized the process. The, the microphone that came with your earbuds or whatever came with your phone are infinitely better than the microphone on your phone itself. So um, there's different ways to do it, but if you can get your phone close enough, you can just plug that in and you know put pin the thing kind of to their, their chest or um, before COVID, you could put just the thing in their ear, but I wouldn't advise doing that now. Um, you could um, put the earbud, kind of tuck it in their shirt, and that'll keep it in place. You could also use um, a piece of double-sided toupee tape to um, connect it to their skin. That's what, when you connect the mic to skin on a, on a film set, it's generally double-sided toupee tape because it doesn't irritate the skin, and it comes off easily at the end. Um, you can use AirPods or wireless earbuds as well, but again, it's not hygienic. So if they have them, great. I wouldn't advise sharing those, especially with um, since we're in a pandemic. Um, but it, at all costs, don't use your phone's built-in microphone or your camera's built-in microphone. Um, it instantly makes your movie seem cheaper and have less production value. And even if it is cheap and you're spending nothing on it, just using any kind of mic that's not that mic will enhance your production so, so, so much. Um, Best Buy also sells these really nice um, inexpensive microphones you can plug into your phone that have much longer cords than the earbuds and things that come with it. Um, that can work really well as well. Just make sure you get the right one for your phone because Apple and Android will have different connections. And your the salesperson at the store should be able to, to help you out um, with that. So I'll do ending the interview and then I'll hand it back to Carrie here. Um, so look over the question list to make sure you've at the end of the interview to make sure you've done all that you need to do. And before you cut, always ask the subject if there's anything else they would like to add, because they might have something that you never would have thought to ask that is really beneficial to your documentary. Cool. Is that me? Yes. Do you have anything else to add? Um, I do at the very end. Do you want me to do the copyright real quick? Sorry. There was a joke because you said all oh, yeah. like <laughs> <laughs> That was good. I wondered if you, that was what you were doing. 
<laughs> yeah, no. Um, so uh, it's good actually that, so I think that this will kind of segue into what you're going to talk about with copyright a little bit, because I just wanted to show some places to get really great visuals um, for uh, U.S. history, particularly and in different time periods that are copyright free, because there are two um, really great sources for this, and they are the Library of Congress and the National Archives. The National Archives throughout um, its history has become the repository for some large photograph collections, as has the Library of Congress. And if the US government took these photographs or kind of led to the creation of these photographs, they're public domain and they're freely available for use, right? Two of these um, that are really interesting, well, there are three, but I'm not gonna show you the third one. The third one is um, the National Archives has a World War I collection, which has, I think, hundreds, I think maybe thousands of photographs from the World War I era in the United States that um, comes to us through the War Office that you can draw upon. But also two really interesting collections are the following, and I'm going to show you where they are just really quick. Um, I'll show them in reverse chronological order because this is the one I have up first. So in the 1970s, the Environmental Protection Agency actually commissioned a series of photographs that they called the Documerica series. Um, and these are awesome. If you like 70s fashion, these photographs are for you. And they cover not only landscapes, but also people and people in a wide swath of environmentally connected activity. So this couple is on a beach, right, in a dune buggy. Um, she looks like she's not having as much fun as he is. Um, but there are also um, photographs of coal miners, for example, of the beaches themselves, of fields, of farmers. So it's really pretty wide ranging. And this is the National Archives catalog. You just get to these photographs and Documerica is... I think, so 625 photographs. There are more in other collections, but you just go to the National Archives catalog. This is one of the links I have on the PowerPoint if you wanna be able to search for photographs and images. Also under the Library of Congress, the Farm Security Administration was the um, kind of New Deal, and then it morphs into the Office of War Information Photographs in the 1930s and the 1940s. All of these images are available. They're in the public domain. They're done by really prominent photographers. So um, they're really just kind of, some of them are beautiful and heartbreaking photos, some uplifting, whatever your topic. My guess is that there might be some resources in the Library of Congress or the National Archives that are public domain and available to you. The Library of Congress has also um, uh, digitized what are called Sanborn fire maps, which are also available for use. These are visually interesting and they provide a lot of information. You can access them through the Library of Congress, but you can also access them for Kansas ones through KU's um, uh, library interface. Uh, I pulled up KU's because they've got Topeka uh, kind of pretty prominently displayed. And so the, and I like the viewer that they have for it. So Sanborn fire maps, are a particular favorite of mine for visuals and for information about what businesses were where in what time period. In the late 19th and the early 20th century, in many cities, the Sanborn Fire Insurance Company created these maps that gave what building or structure was in what location, what was it made of? That's the different colors. Um, who owned it in some cases, because they got the title of the business. These were created by the insurance company for insurance purposes, right? They wanted to know who was where and what kind of claim they could make on insurance in case of fire. They resulted in this really awesome collection of visuals where you can go and see um, city blocks. You can map these or um, it's called uh, I forget the word for it, but you can map them to our contemporary maps if you want to see what was on your block 100 years ago, right? So some of the unanticipated, I don't think that they imagined when they created these huge books that a historian 100 years from then would be looking at them in order to use them as visuals to tell them about the city, um, but they're 
you know, really visually interesting and have great information about what the economic base for a particular city was. And I don't think very many people know they exist. So I always give them a pitch. If you go to the Topeka room um, at the Topeka Public Library, uh, Topeka and Shawnee County Public Library, these are digitized versions of huge books and you can see the actual book. It's cool, you gotta go. So um, I'll show those for a moment and then I can come back and talk about more stuff, but this is probably a great time to talk about copyright. Um, since we're thinking about using different sources and we've been nabbed on that already today. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> definitely. Um, and surprisingly, we're actually running out of time. This has been so much fun that <laughs> it's gone faster than I thought. Is that okay, Carrie? That's fine by me. I don't know I'll, if you want to open up for questions or anything like that. I'm happy to answer them, but I think yeah. probably the copyright is good to get in here at least the beginnings of it. Okay. Yeah. I'll um, I, I share. Okay. Let, I'll just kind of go through the really important parts. Um, kind of skip the this part of it. Um, and um, in terms of what you would most likely use it for. Okay. So for fair use. Um, to use other content in your doc. There's a safe harbor that um, this really great book called Clearance and Copyright, if you really want to look into it, it's written by two of the best lawyers in this um, area. Um, so if you're in this safe harbor, you're okay. So does the asset illustrate or support a point that the creator is trying to make in the new work? Does the creator of the new work use only as much of the asset as is reasonably appropriate to illustrate or support the point being made? And is the connection between the point being made and the asset used to illustrate or support the point clear to the average viewer? So those are um, the fair use in terms of how you can protect yourself. Um, a couple other things I just wanna touch on is to protect yourself. Um, your work is actually automatically protected since 1978. You don't have to do anything else to get it copyright protected. Now the trick though comes in actually that holding up in court. So there is a kind of an old wives tale or um, a, a rumor that if you mail something to yourself um, that it becomes instantly copy or that, it, that that will hold up in court. That's actually not true. It has, has not held up in court, um, but I've heard a lot of people say that, but it is not true. And the clearance and copyright book goes into examples of why it's not true. Um, and the other thing to consider is your treatment is really important because it's not your ideas that are protected, it's the execution. So if you have the um, treatment and you have all the different revisions you've made, that's a really great paper trail to show that you've been working on this and that your execution is this specific. Um, but the courts have said ideas are as free as the air. So um, your idea is not at all protected. It's solely the execution of that idea itself. So it's a little bit um, iffy there, but your treatment is the best way to protect yourself. The other thing you can do is you can register with the Writers Guild of America. Um, they lock a copy of your, your writing in a, in a safe. Um, and that safe can only be opened by either yourself or a court order. So that is, is, a, is a really great way to protect yourself. The other way to protect yourself is to ensure that um, when you are um, talking to someone about your, your project, that you mention that it is not free because otherwise it's implied that it's free. So in any email, say something like, I appreciate you considering my project for purchase or something like that. So there's a paper trail that you could show in court very easily um, that you are not offering it up for free. And I think that's where I'll stop with that. We do have a question. Um, Dylan Warrington asks, that brings a question. Say you finished the documentary and has actually been shown a few times in various places. What if a person in the documentary says they no longer want to be in it or their story to be told? Um, do you want me, me to do this one, Carrie? And then, okay. So there's an ethical question. There's a legal question here. Um, the legal question is if you have a signed document that they've signed, you can legally use their stuff. But the ethical question is, um, if someone is requesting their image not to be used in your property, even if you legally can, um, in my opinion, it is, it is not ethically sound to then use that footage. Um, you know, it, it, especially for a documentary where you're wanting to respect the subject. Um, now, 
the only circumstance I could see that that maybe not necessarily being applied is if someone has done a nefarious action. And if something they say, you know, if they are, they're in jail or, you know, something and they don't want to be in it because they have, um, they've said something that further leads to that nefarious action. And that's what you're trying to prove in the doc that could potentially be ethically okay, but it's a really fine line. And I suggest that you really define that for yourself before you begin your project, because um, you definitely want to respect your people and you definitely, you know, want to respect that. But what if, you know, what if say with the, the recent court case, right. Um, you interview Mr. I don't know how to print Mr. Chauvin. Um, you interview him and then later he finds out your documentary is against him and he decides to pull his support and he doesn't want to be in it anymore. To me, that would be a case where you still include it. Um, but it's definitely an ethical quandary. Carrie, did you have anything to add to that? So I'm glad that you answered first because this this is a place where documentaries and kind of historical work, you know, there may be some differences in there. So historians, when they conduct oral histories, so to me, it would also differ too by who you are interviewing, right? So um, if it is an oral history that historians do, we at the beginning have a document that the person signs um, that kind of uh, that commits to the oral history because our presumption is it will be archived somewhere, right? Um, so um, that may lay out the rights of the person at any given moment. So for us, the decision may have already been made, um, except a lot of our works are published and it's very hard to take back, uh, you know, kind of books out of circulation and things like that. There's also an increasing kind of um, discussion of, for digital projects, Creative Commons licenses, where the interviewee and the interviewer have intellectual property in the interview. So that could become a question that might be really interesting. Um, you might, I, I would say the thing that I think I wanted to add to this discussion is that this is why having a conversation before you begin and making sure you are clear to the person about what they are committing to and at what points it would be good to hear back. Historians also send transcripts back to the person of their interviews before they put before they put it into their work that's a really good place to clarify and ask additional questions and also give the person another chance to kind of look at the information that they've given. So I would say just contact at many different points is really important um, to create a respectful process. Very true. And in filmmaking too, you would also, they would have a contract that they sign before for narrative or for documentary. And usually they're very wide. I mean, a lot of times they'll even say in the universe through perpetuity, like, that, that they can be used. So that's why I say legally, if they've signed the contract, yes, you can, but I don't want to leave that hundred percent open because there could be something really hurtful or harmful or, you know, that's disrespectful to the subject. So I think it's kind of an ethical question. Um, that was an awesome question. I think that's a good one to end on. We do have to end because we've got to get to the, the narrative shorts that are starting here pretty soon. Thank you so much, Dr. Wynn. I really appreciate you doing this with me. I, I learned, I learned more today, even than I learned last summer. So I always love discussing this, this topic with you. So, um, thank you very much and, uh, hope everybody enjoys the narrative shorts coming up.